date says, it says, oh, good morning. Good morning. I don't, know, I don't know if anyone noticed the date I put in. It says January 12th, 32. So we're in 2032, which is ironically, oh my gosh, I would be, be retiring. We'd be retiring. So <laughs> perfect topic for retirement today. <laughs> oh, I don't want to fast forward time, but how? Really? Because I keep on my calendar. We might be on a beach right now if it was 2032. Yes, we would. It'd be January. We wouldn't be here. It, I have my yeah. physical calendar at home. I keep crossing off days because the month of January in March. So long. So long. Always gives me. Um, but you know what's a good thing to do when you don't have as much to do in January and February and March? Tell us. Is get your affairs in order, Jen. Get <laughs> Get your affairs in order. That's Get a those very. Bills. Yeah, it's a good time. It is a good time. Um, and that's what we're talking about today. And there was a lot of buzz about it when we, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes we post our coffee confession ad and it's like crickets. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing. No one has anything to say about anything. They're watching. They're watching. Um, but today, last night, um, the idea of estate planning and making sure your future is taken care of and. Mm. All of that, um, there were a lot of questions, and we have a special guest today. We're going to talk yes. all about the things that, as a, you know, before you're married, before you have kids, yes, everyone should have their, their estate planned out. But I think it's like the pinnacle of importance when you're in like the stage we're in right now, because there's a lot at stake. You've worked hard, you love your family, you want to make sure everything's taken care of. If something, it's like life insurance, nobody wants to pay for life insurance, and you hopefully never have to use it. But Alicia can tell us from, from mm. personal experience yeah, yeah. that mm -hmm. things happen. So Alicia, mm -hmm. why don't you, you well, start? Yeah. Well, it's, yeah. Do you want to? Yeah. So uh, let's bring Karen on and then you on. can yeah, start I mean, telling just, us why. Everybody knows. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to put you right in the middle. There you yeah. Go. So you can hear us. <laughs> you can hear us equally. Good morning. Good morning. If that's Thank how the sound works. <laughs> Um, good morning. Yes. Uh, well, guys, I am not the most, I don't have a will and I'm very ill prepared. Um, although I've worked hard at getting two parents prepared and been involved in their trust and, and Karen has helped my father, uh, tremendously. And I will tell you that they're, especially with the older generation, there's a little bit of fear and like, who, who am I giving my power to? Who am I giving my money to? It's, there's some sort of psychology around it too. And my, my dad was super hesitant and he just didn't know. He just, and I'm like, dad, we're doing this because what I had to go through with my grandmother and my mom, although they had wills, there were other things that needed to be in place too. So although we don't want to think about the end, it's important that we keep our assets safe and in, in our control, I, this is my personal and not the state's control where you end up in a nursing home and they take everything from you. Yeah. That's definitely a part of it. There. Yeah. Um, and then I think the other part, I know we did a will when my daughter was born. So 16 mm. years ago, um, because I, I don't have many assets. I mean, we have our house. I remember they asked like, do you have furs, diamond like jewels over a certain yeah. value like no no we got nothing but it's your children that god forbid something happens to you and your spouse what happens to your kids and my will right now willed our children to my parents who at the time my mom was 50. i mean she was young she was 49 when my daughter was born now she's not 50. i don't can do the math right now she's 64. and you know, we recently said, she's like, now she's older. She doesn't necessarily like want to raise three kids. And my kids are older, but I, I need to update that, you know, to one of my siblings at the time, nobody was married. Everybody was young. I, I wasn't comfortable, but things change. So even if you have all this paperwork in place, we're going to chat today about maybe you need to update your paperwork like I do. So you might be in Alicia. I don't know if, you know, we're going to put in the comments. Are you Alicia? You have nothing done. Or are you me and you have stuff done and you, you just have to update it? Or are you up to snuff and you are ready to roll yeah. and you are a good example for all of us? So, Karen, we're going to yeah. get down to the, uh, you're the expert. We'll stop talking. Let, let you talk. But why don't people have this stuff done? Well, a couple of reasons. One, you touched on, you know, you're talking about your demise. <clears throat> Usually, um, it's a husband and wife that come in 
to to set up wills for themselves. So they're they're talking about their demise and talking about their spouse's demise, two things you really don't want to talk about. Mm-hmm. When you start digging into the details of the will, you have to ask questions. I have to ask questions. I try to do it generically, not based on their exact situation. So, but but I have to say something like, well, if one of your children predeceases you, if one of your children dies before you, mm-hmm. another thing that's very taboo that no one wants to think about, um, what would you want to do in that case? So uncomfortable conversations all around. Also, there's just a general, um, well, this is this is something that's going to benefit me or my my family in 5, 10, 20 years. So why is it a priority now? Uh, but if you don't get it in order, uh, you know, as you get older, you're less likely to get it in, in order. And then if you have a health problem, uh, you know, it could become too late. So it's good to do it while you're while you're healthy and thinking about it. Uh, the sooner, the better. You mentioned something that's so interesting. And I was going to say this is the most important uh, decision for parents with regard to estate planning. Who would get your children? If you and your husband, you know, you're on vacation, the plane crashes, God forbid, uh, who would take care of your minor children? And that's a tough question. Um, it changes. You know, in a lot of cases, you might pick your uh, your sibling and your sibling-in-law, but then they're no longer married. Uh, that happens. Th- then you have a problem. Yeah. Yep. Um, a lot of times the relationships change between you and whoever you had named as your uh, person to be the guardian a couple of years ago. Uh, the other thing is you have to go and talk to the person and say, hey, uh, Mary and John, um, I'm doing my will. God forbid this happens to me and my husband. Will you take care of my kids? <laughs> you don't want to you don't want to miss this upon them. Uh, <laughs> but, but they know. Bad news. You know, that's the kind of thing you really have mm-hmm. to talk to them about. And, and even go back to them over time, you know, every, every four five, six years and say, Hey, you know, just, I'm reviewing my estate planning. I have you named as the guardian for the kids. Is that still good? Is that still something you would, you would want to do? And then yeah. the considerations there are things like they live near where you live. Uh, they are in the same position. They wouldn't have to change. The rules if they live. You know, really great people. And if it couldn't be me and my husband or me and my wife, raising them, the people have my values and I would want them to, uh, raise them. That that I think is the trickiest question because it doesn't just involve you and it involves third parties. Um, and it kind of can evolve over time. Yeah. And it just pulls at your heartstring. I mean, nobody wants to think about that. I think that's the number one reason uh, yeah. people avoid it. And some people don't have siblings that they would live, leave there. I mean, I've had these conversations. Those people know and I wrote letters when we went to Spain. Does that even hold <laughs> up in court? I don't know, yeah. but... In the absence of something else, you know, yes, it would. Yeah. But it's better to have no gray area, yes. literally in black and white. Right. And, like, could you could you do, like, so I have it where um, my, my best friend has my children, but my brother would take care of, like, the finances. I don't know if that's something. What is that? So that's <laughs> Does that make great. sense? <laughs> I was going to say that's the second most important decision that there's there's really no agreement upon so in your will you would say uh you know mary and john would get my kids if if me and my spouse both die um and then your assets you you wouldn't you know i know your kids i know all of your kids they're great kids but you wouldn't want to give them you know the six-figure value of your house at age 12 or 14 or 17 Mm -hmm. probably not even 19. yeah Yeah, just gonna say you would set up trust (laughs) so in your will it would say if me and my spouse are both gone, our assets are going to go into trust for the benefit of our children. Uh, and there's two schools of thought. One, the, the person who's the guardian or the people who are the guardians for the kids should control the trust. Um, it's a little smoother that way. There's, there's only one decision maker for, you know, the, the person who's going to tell them to go to bed and do their homework um, is also the person that's going to make the financial decisions. So there's an ease of, you know, decision making there. Uh, the other school of thought, which is equally valid, is maybe you want some checks and balances there. Maybe you want somebody doing the day-to-day raising of the children, but another person in there who's maybe more financially capable or just kind of uh, have another person looking out for the best interest of your kid and that's the, or kids. And that's that's something to talk about with your spouse, talk about with the people that you're thinking of naming guardians, trustees. Um it, it, it could go either way. It's just yeah. something you really have to think about and talk about. And when I first meet with people on this, they said, oh, yeah, I hadn't really thought about that. And they, you know, they go home and they have conversations and then they ultimately, ultimately make a decision. So it's something you should take your time. You know, it's a good 
maybe have a nice date night where you go and discuss this with your spouse, then go be, <laughs> then go in and talk to Karen or your attorney and then go mm -hmm. back and think of, you know, it's not a rush, rush choice. Go to Sloop Brewery, have a couple of <laughs> That's good. I was just <laughs> thinking, I'm like, where can they go? <laughs> yeah, maybe you could, like, this could be a workshop. I, I'm telling you, this could be a whole new this, niche, niche industry there. This could definitely. Um, let us know yeah. if you want a little like could, could <laughs> we do like a group up. they do that at school they not anymore yeah. but they have before i had children and a husband they put yeah. they had workshops where there was someone I, like else. estate planning i just think that would help get over some of the uncomfortableness of of this it's a little more fun than just talking yeah. about you love no yeah. longer living wine yes. wine and wills um, stay tuned we're gonna we're gonna organize that so we know that you need a will can you tell us what other legal, you know, the will is like the big famous sure. one. What else do you need to have in place? Let me uh, just add one more thing because it's, it's another decision and I touched on it. Mm -hmm. If you were to set up your will and then put the, uh, the proceeds of the will, your assets into a trust for your minor children, then the big decision becomes when do they get access to that money? When do they no longer need the trustee to make the decisions? Would it be 18, 21, or 25? Those are the those are the common choices, although it could be, you could say 22 and a half if you wanted. Uh, my view, 18 is too, too young. Uh, yes. you know, after all, I'm not giving her uh, you know, mm -mm. door dash it all the way, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I said 25. I, I think you start thinking, okay, this person is, is an adult and can make their own financial decisions. So, so A, figuring out that age, and then so prioritizing, saying, well, the first X amount should go towards education. You know, that's our big concern for our kids is making sure they get an education and get set up for a prosperous life. So, you know, you can say $100,000 of assets go towards education. Then after that, the trustee can decide. And then at age 22 or 25, uh, then, the you know, your child, your adult child at that point, start making their own decisions. The example I like to give, and I think you ladies will appreciate this, and my, my wife loves Beverly Hills 90210. If you recall, As you <laughs> if you recall, Dylan's father, although we learned, spoiler alert, we learned his father was not actually dead, but first 10 years. <laughs> I mean, we thought he was. But he was by himself. But he had a trust. And Jack Walsh, Brandon and Brenda's father, was the trustee. So when he yes. wanted to buy a Porsche or something, he had to go to Jack Walsh. And that's because Jack Walsh was the trustee. Um, I guess at some point, Dylan got to control his own money. and uh, But in, in the high school years, it was it was uh, trustee Mr. Walsh who was making those decisions. So that's you know that's that's uh, five hundred. That's the basic setup of the trust that okay. we created out of. Because like let's say you know something happens to us tomorrow, and it would be my um, my friend Heather, and but we we wanted to keep Ben and Lily and all their activities. We wouldn't want anything like that to change. That money would go direct like she would have access to that money to pay for that or would that come out of her own so your like, your estate would would continue to pay for that's your what I thought. Okay. lifestyles and and their, mm -hmm. their activities yes. clothes and their vacations and things uh but it would be the trustee making the decision the trustee has a has a legal obligation they have a fiduciary obligation to do what's best in the best interest uh, right. of children in that case um, so, you know, you're going to pick a good person, but backing that up is there is that legal obligation. Um, if in a unusual scenario where that trustee was not doing the right thing, you, you could bring them to court and, uh, change trustees, but you're better off just picking a, a trustee that, you know, is going to be rock solid for the, for the long term. Can I ask a uncomfortable question before we move on from wills? What if you don't have a will you and your spouse? Die in that plane crash, which is my worst fear, and I always want to fly separately if we go anywhere. But if they, if that happens, what happens to your estate, to your children? Who makes those decisions? Sure. So, so there is um, in in statute, in the estates law, in New York State, there is a, a formula basically that you know to summarize it. It goes to next of kin. It goes to the the closer relatives. If you don't if you don't name somebody uh, in your will, um, your assets would go to. You know, uh, first it would go to your, if you and your spouse died, if your parents were alive, then it would go to your siblings and, and so forth. And there's a whole sort of pecking order um, that it would, mm -hmm. but then you're not making the decision. The law mm -hmm. applied generally to everybody, 
uh, is making the decision for you. Uh, so, you know, most people don't want that. Uh, there's no provision in there to, uh, you know, decide for your kids. If you don't have a will, there's, there's no decision on your kids. So somebody besides you is going to determine who's raising your kids, which no one wants. Um, so, yes, there is a there is a, you know, a backup plan, so to speak. But it's, it's an inferior uh, plan that actually decisions yourself. Yeah, you'd rather be in control of that. Um, so what else do we need besides a will? One more the other documents. Because this is important too, and I and I find it very I always encourage my clients to put a, a no contest clause in their will. Um, and basically what that says is if anybody contests this will, um, if anybody goes to court and says, I should have gotten more or I should get something, they automatically get nothing. I I love that. One of your clients told me about that, and I thought that was the greatest mm -hmm. <laughs> thing. It puts people in check. Somebody was thinking about mm -hmm. being it backs them right off. And they say, well, okay, maybe I, maybe I don't want to mess around. Maybe I'll just be happy with what I was left. Yeah. Cause that could be, that could be definitely sticky. My brother and I are been very good about all of that, but I've people, people ask me all the time, how did you guys decide? And cause not everything in a will is like, well, I really wanted mom's, um, you know, lipstick that she, it's, yeah. you know, it's not, <laughs> yes. it's not that detailed all the time. And, um, it could be, it could be very sticky. I hear so. Yeah, that's a it's like a divorce. Idea. It's like a divorce and will. Like yeah, those assets people get what, crazy. Those kind of specific items, you know, the uh, the the uh, you know the the fancy classic car or right. yeah. jewelry and things like that. If they're not itemized, usually the will will say it's at the as that it's at the executor's discretion, right. and then and then uh, you know you are in some potentially into into a difficult area. Um, that speaks to itemizing everything. If you have these prized, tangible possessions, outline them in your will and say, if if my classic car is still in my possession when I die, then I want it to go to whoever I want it to go to. Um, the, the the less you leave up to the executor or to chance, the better. I got nothing. My will would be very simple. <laughs> <laughs> my favorite mug I will give to you. <laughs> Another important thing uh, that people don't realize, and uh, it's, it's kind of interesting, in New York State, you cannot disinherit your spouse. So let's say I love my wife, you know my wife, uh, but let's say I had a spouse that I really didn't care for. And I write a will and I say, spouse, you get nothing. And I give it to my girlfriend, hypothetically. Yeah. <laughs> I can't, quite the scandal. can't do that in New York State. Your spouse is entitled $50,000 or one third of the estate. And that is very interesting. Yes. Hmm. That would cause that would cause some scandal. I I have heard that was a trip that was a myth or not that you could uh not write them out. You can't. Yeah, it's like a movie storyline. As an they don't want people being destitute and mm -hmm. right. you know if, if you if you want to disinherit your spouse, maybe you should end the marriage. You know. I'm yes. Not, yeah. <laughs> that might be the first step. That then you then you don't have a spouse anymore and you don't yeah. have to do anything. They could call you for a different reason. You could handle that. <laughs> Okay, so what a living trust you had mentioned. I'm not sure if I know what that is. Well, the trust that we were talking about for uh, benefit of minor children, that would be an example of a living trust. Okay. Um, that is a living trust. And I'll contrast that with something that you're probably familiar with, an irrevocable trust, uh, which is something that uh, you cannot change it. So what commonly happens for Medicaid purposes, in case someone at some point was going to need inpatient care paid for by Medicaid. Medicaid looks at your assets and says, hey, you have a $300,000 house or a $400,000 house. You can, you can pay the $20,000 a month nursing home bill. But there is a provision in the law that says if you put your assets into an irrevocable trust, and the key word there is irrevocable, because once you put the once you put the asset in there, you can't change your mind. You can't say, oh, I'm out of the nursing home. I'm going to take my house back out of the trust. It's irrevocable. Once you put it in there, uh, and 60 months go by or five years go by, no, New York no longer looks at it. Medicaid no longer looks at it as an asset of yours. Um, and they're not going to hold it against you um, as far as paying for your inpatient uh, nursing home care, long-term facility. Uh, I say, I would say to everyone, if you have parents that ha don't have that yet, push them to do, you, to do that. At first, they might think like, "Ooh, what are you after?" It is so important that five-year look back, which could probably be pushed to seven-year look back. Any, I don't know. That's just my personal it, feeling. Eliminated. It could be eliminated because it it costs Medicaid a lot of money. 
Mm-hmm. Sure. You know, something in New York State or some is going to be looking. Hey, we save a lot of money here, and 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 push for that to be eliminated. It's kind of a blessing that it exists. It it certainly is. Mm-hmm. I did not my I don't know what my grandmother was doing, but that did not help her. And we were at the you know, they took they took whatever she had, and there's some things that they couldn't take. So like yeah. she didn't have to. I, I could use her money to pay for my mom's funeral if that makes it like, okay that's great but it's really important and i tell everybody and they like kind of look at me like oh i'm like it is so important do it so this might not be something you need right now but something that if you have parents you know you're around our age and your parents are you know yes. alive that's something that and it is scary because you're giving essentially giving your children power over your estate Right. It's a circle of life, though. Like, it's just the way it is. <laughs> you set up that irrevocable trust. You name a trustee, someone that you trust, mm-hmm. the most responsible child or the oldest child. And then that person, again, has the fiduciary duty. Uh, they have to do what's best for the what's called the grantor, the person who started the trust. And um, the only kind of logistical issue is when you have to sell that your parents wouldn't be signing the contract and signing the signing the deed mm-hmm. the would be would, would be the one doing that so you know it's it's not a it's not a hugely difficult thing but going through the closing would be the trustee not necessarily your parents to sign the document for example and then what happens is uh, you know a lot of people get older and they downsize and you go from a four bedroom house to a, a two bedroom condo if the house was in the trust well you sell the house the proceeds of the house sale go into the trust and then you buy the condo um, you know, for half what you sold your house for, the condo stays in the trust. That other half profit, for lack of a better term, stays in the trust, and the trustee can invest uh, do whatever's best for the uh, whatever's best for the uh, the person who made the trust, and it's protected from Medicaid after that five year look back period. Mm-hmm. Which, again, Alicia and I have been down that road with Medicaid. It is, yeah. and Oof. not to scare anyone, my father in law was six. He had just turned sixty and had a catastrophic stroke, and you know, ended up, you know, passing away maybe seven years after, but those seven years were filled with Medicaid fight. It's the amount mm-hmm. of time and energy and money that just, it just drains you. So if, but, and he was young, he didn't think about those things at that time. So it's never too early to start thinking about, you know, <laughs> the catastrophe that might strike. I know that's horrible to say it like that, but you have to be prepared like a boy scout, mm-hmm. be prepared. Yes. Yes. That's what this is. Preparing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so what else? We have the will, a living trust, power of attorney. Help. Power. Yeah. Yeah. Power yes. of attorney. So often it's good for uh, spouses to give each other power of attorney. Um, let's say uh, usually husband and wife own the house together. Uh, let's say one spouse was incapacitated, wasn't able to, um, you know, participate in a transaction and you needed to sell the house, you wanted to sell the house and move to Florida. Uh, that power of attorney would come in handy because then the the spouse who was incapacitated wouldn't have to uh uh you know participate in the sale of the house or any other uh financial transactions also good to give a power of attorney get a power of attorney from um children when they go off to college uh and you can do you can make you know transactions for them and and uh act on their behalf if they're especially if they're in california uh now things are modern it's a little easier to you know shuffle papers you can email documents and print them out but still a good practice to have uh health proxy i think healthcare. very important if you're unable to make healthcare decisions for yourself who do you want to make those decisions um usually husband gives it to wife and wife gives it to husband um but if if you don't want to do that there's other you know siblings close friends close relatives uh to make those decisions for you very good idea to have those kinds of things in place uh because when you need them it's too late so if you have them in place when you're you know you're level headed and you're just you know thinking dispassionately about the future that's the best time to sit down and make these decisions and you know god forbid you need them they're in place and you have the right person uh doing the job right well and that's we joke in my family that you know my one sister will like keep you on life support for 100 years like she would never ever make that decision she's that's just and I feel differently. And we have said to my parents, well, what is your wish? Because if that, don't give the power to her, <laughs> she'll keep you going. I mean, out of love, but you have to know 
you have to let your family know what your wishes are. Like, what what do you want? And make sure the right person has that power. Like you said. Right. So unless yeah, a little different. Uh, what you're thinking of is the living will, which is the next. Oh, that's different. Planning. Okay. The the healthcare proxy is let's have surgery, let's not have surgery. Let's go okay. to that. Go to that. The living will is what you're talking about. You know, pulling the plug decisions. Mm -hmm. What the person does is when I make my living will, I say, I want to be kept alive under these circumstances. I do not want to be kept alive if the quality of life is so low under those circumstances. And, and that's a real uh, gift to your, to your family, because mm -hmm. then they know exactly what you want and they're carrying out your wishes, not trying to make a decision, um, you know, for you without being informed of what you really want. So it, it, some people call it a comfort document. It makes your family yeah. Comfortable, um, you know, and have in, in a very difficult time having to make a very difficult decision. You're essentially on paper in advance making that decision for them. Yeah, um, it's it's super important because I, people will people wondered with my mom like why is this going so fast or what she wore a bracelet. Everyone telling us exactly what she wanted was very clear about it. it was in a will in a notebook on her brace on her wrist, and although we found that hard. This is what she wanted and was very clear about that throughout her whole illness. But it's so important because people will question you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. And yeah. that's hard. Again, yeah. it's uncomfortable, but you have to, you have to do yeah. it. I mean, you yeah. have to, nobody wants to think about it. And nobody um, thinks about this stuff until it happens no. to you and you're like, oh. <laughs> no. And you mentioned, you know, when you're 18, some of these stuff, when your children, which for Karen and I, that's not very far off. Like our oldest daughters will be 18 in like a year and a half. Right. Mm -hmm. to, to think about these things that and going off to, to college, one of um, our moms commented yesterday and said that she has two kids that are already in college. And she said when she sends them off, she puts all these documents in like a folder and gives them, tells their roommates, their housemates, what's in that folder. God forbid, like someone has to go to the hospital or whatever it is. She says, make sure you bring these documents with you. And like you said, now everything's electronic email. I'm sure it's a little easier, but just have that paper backup, knowing your kid, especially if they're like, say in California, they're far away, knowing you can't get there quick enough. Someone knows what your kid needs um, because they're 18, they're an adult, right? Yeah. Like you can't technically make those decisions, but that paperwork gives you a little bit more leeway. Yeah. Well, if, if, if one of them is a healthcare proxy, you can make those decisions. Yeah. Again. Oh, yes. And that's that's the thinking behind those when college, because typically you go to college, you're 18, 19, 20, 20, even 22, make your own health care decisions. But, um, you know, if you're not able to make those decisions, your parent wants to make them, not somebody else. So you have that health care proxy in place with your parent as the proxy um, that that gives the parent the ability to make those decisions if the student is unable to. Yes. Now, somebody else asked the question, bank accounts. Do you need a beneficiary for your bank accounts or is that covered like in a will? Well, it could be covered by the will. If if uh, typically a will says, you know, give uh, my jewelry, my car and the specific things to uh, my friend and my residuary estate, everything left because you don't know what you're going to have when the time comes. You write the will now and, and then you die in 30 years. You know, what you have now is going to be different than, than what you and so you estate will go to um, whoever you whoever you determine should get it. So that that's everything else will go into that um, residuary. Okay, and that's something else. I know my like retirement accounts. I think my parents are still my beneficiary. Like I need to update. Like with that override, what so, everything else. Says? So that is not part of your estate. So if you have a four hundred and one k, you have a life insurance, mm -hmm. um, you have a named beneficiary. Right. Or or you can have a beneficiary to your bank account, which I didn't, I didn't quite answer that question a second ago. Yeah. Or you can be on the bank account with somebody else. And, uh, when, oh, you know, when 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 two two people on a bank account, when one of them mm -hmm. passes away, the other person just that's becomes important part too. of the money. Yes. Good thing. Very, to yes. do. Very pay. good. Uh, because remember, even though you're setting this up, there still is a court process. You still have to get. Even if you have the will and you're named executor, you still have to get what are called letters testamentary um, mm -hmm. or make sure you're the real executor, make sure it's a real will. So that, that doesn't take five minutes. You know, that, that could take a couple of weeks, could take a little longer depending on the, the court calendar. Um, mm -hmm. But that other stuff passes immediately to 
the beneficiary. Same with your house, probably. If you own your house as husband and wife, for example, when one spouse dies, the other spouse just automatically takes it's got it. the house. And that's that's preferable. The more, the fewer things you can have going through the will, the better, because it's... it's yeah, much easier. So let's say, you know, hopefully everybody's now making their January 12th New Year's resolution that if you don't have these things in place, or if, like, like me, I have things in place, but they're outdated and need to be looked at again. What's the next step? How do people get started? Let's say they're local, right? And they want to contact you. Um, or if they're- or do you local. have to be local? I mean- Well, I mean, you don't have to be local. Typically, this is the way it works. Somebody calls me says, I need a will. I need estate planning tools. I send them a questionnaire so I can have an idea of you know how many kids they have, how old they are, what their assets are. And then based on that, I'll draft the documents. And I'll email them to them and we'll make edits. And then once we get a final version of the will or whatever the document is, then we'll set up a meeting. You do have to do that in person. There are some, oh, okay. you have to have two disinterested witnesses um, witness the witness the execution of the will. Um, so, you know, that you couldn't do remotely. There was a brief yes. time for remote witnesses during COVID. Yes. yes. That was a, a, a interesting process. Yeah. Back door to door. During COVID, Kieran did door-to-door -door wills. I know. <laughs> like, I know. Literally, like, you know, because it was that, so, you know, everyone couldn't be in an office. Yeah. <laughs> Masked wills. It was, um. I mean, but that yeah. was a time that was probably good, good for estate planning business yeah. during that right. uncertain time. People wanted their affairs in order. Yeah. See? COVID was good for something. Get um, around and think about <laughs> Nothing else going on. You know? That's right. Think about <laughs> think about your death. Um, but in the end, we work hard. Everybody here works hard. You've accumulated, you know, a house. You you've built a beautiful family. You want to make sure that those things are in. You know, you have a plan in place. They're protected. Your children are protected. Your assets are protected. Mm. Definitely. So, so you work your whole life, right? I mean, mm -hmm. we've now worked for more of our lives than we didn't work. Right? We adults now longer than we're children. Um, and True. You, you want that to go where you want it to go. You want it to go to the people you love and the people you decide. You don't want a court deciding that. You don't want some other third party deciding that. You don't want yeah. Medicaid to take that. So yeah. set up the plan now, and your decisions will be carried out, and to the extent possible, your, your assets will be protected. Yeah, and like you said, you could always change it. You know, don't feel like you're, well, I'm not sure yet. Like, you could put yeah. it in place, and then... If you get divorced or there's 10 yeah. years from now, you can, you can revise those things. It's not once and one and done. Correct. And you don't even have a whole new will, for example. It was called a codicil, which is a, an amendment to the will. So if you just have one, one change, add that page. It has to have that, those same witnesses and formalities. Mm -hmm. the process. Um, that, that's, that's what I'll be calling you to do. Yes. <laughs> to just change, yeah, like, absolutely. One day. It's just it's like the responsible thing to do. It's like we do all these things and we have everything for our kids. Okay, we want benefits for them. We want them, you know, pretty much like a safe haven for them. But then this mm -hmm. is the one thing that people leave out. And I, me, I'm included in that. Um, so it's, yeah, get yes. going on that. It's just a responsible so. thing to do. Like we should, just yeah. should do it. Like when you leave the hospital with your child, they should be like, okay, we're going to set you up with a... Um, yeah, an appointment with uh, Karen Lawler. <laughs> Maybe I'll park my car outside the maternity. I uh, it's not a bad idea. I'll tell you, we are filled with business growth ideas. For we you. really are. <laughs> Wine and it for ourselves, but anyone else? This new Lawler law firm branding in pink is. Uh, <laughs> tell you, I like that. I like you know? that. I like it. Yep. Or Mom's... follow him on um, Hudson yeah. Broker, right? The oh, Hudson Broker. That's news. Yeah, that's yeah. That's news. Yeah. I know that's not. Yes. But I was just thinking of your colors. All right. Yeah. You know, red, white, and blue. Jack of all trades. Yes. Karen of all this trades. Yeah. Yep. So, you know, if you are local, because you do have to be somewhat, and when we say local, can you be in yeah. Connecticut? Can a New York lawyer do a Connecticut person? Uh, typically, you wouldn't because they're. No. Okay. And you're not admitted. I'm not admitted in Connecticut. If you were admitted, okay, okay. that's yeah. all right. So New York, New York is we're very close to Connecticut. That's why I mentioned. Um, One million you know, Hudson Valley. Yep. <laughs> Come give Kieran a call. He'll you know at least just to get that conversation going. Um, mm -hmm. Because you know you want to work with someone who you're comfortable with. Um, but I, you know, when we did our little promo. We put attorney slash dad because I always think that's important that somebody is you know Karen, a father of four. That's you know he's a husband. He's he's a business owner. He kind of yes. knows like he gets it. Not, yeah, he's not like up in 
ivory tower like you know just he he's in the trenches with parents knowing the thing the challenges and the situations you're in so it's a really it's a good perspective to be coming from i also yeah. like to meet I, you know most people work eight to four nine to five so i i mm -hmm. often meet clients at this time seven in the morning six to mm -hmm. seven I, that's convenient yes. my, my dad was a cpa His office was in our house and he was meeting people 10 o'clock at night sometimes that's what that kind of stuff. Oh, that's awesome. That's the working, the working that's the best. mom needs. Yeah. It's you impossible. think at 5.45 in the morning, but <laughs> 5.45. <laughs> He's up. You can do you it. You know? Pull it off. Possible. Well, thank you, Karen. Thank you, so thank you for the, uh, and see, we managed to make Will's fun yes. on, on a Thursday morning. We did. <laughs> all right. We will put all the links in the comments. You guys yes. can click on them and let us know if you watched on the replay. And if you have any other questions, We'll, we'll answer them after. All right. I got to right. Daddy Dash now. Get the I know. Me too. <laughs> I got to jump. Peanut butter now. and jelly going. All right. Bye, everyone.